Hi, I'm Angel Rebo with Mindalia TV and we are here today with Estefania Magidsen. Hi Estefania, how are you? Hello Angel, nice to see you and to talk to you. It's a blessing for us to have you here, thank you. Thank you. So the first question is, you know, what is that thing in your life that you, know, you are most passionate about? I guess I'm passionate at trying to feel the rapture of being alive and basically doing that through the love that I experience for God, for my family, for the foundation that I run, which sends Romanian orphan youth to college, and really for my fellow human beings. You wrote a book uh, yes. you know, that you brought actually with yes. you, and it's about the conversation of two powerful women, right? Yes. What, could you tell us a little bit about it? Yes, I was invited about five years ago by Carmen Firan, who is a Romanian-American novelist, journalist. I was invited to do an interview about the foundation that I run, except that our conversation reached territories that were a lot more profound than she expected, and a lot more spiritual, and that one article became two and then it became 13 monthly articles that were published in a Romanian literary magazine and then that became a book searching for the white magician which also just came out in November in the United States and it's a book where I explore with her themes that range from philanthropy to immigration I'm an immigrant to spiritual psychology in which I have a master's degree and the manifestation of destiny. It also has chapters on our dream work, chakras, a chapter where I explore femininity and feminism. So it really covers a very broad range of topics, but I would say the underlying leitmotiv is how does spirit and God inform our life and how we live our life. Are spirituality and your foundation related in any way? Well, the foundation has really been a byproduct of my spiritual life. Our two sons were young, three and five years of age, when I kept thinking in my prayers, I kept thanking God for the fact that they were healthy, they had everything they needed, and then in a very organic kind of way I heard in my head well what about the kids who don't have the same thing so I went back to Romania and I visited an orphanage there and I had all these kids who jumped into my lap and they were calling me mama so I knew I had to come back and do something for them I think that throughout our lives we have these moments where we get goosebumps and we get information from our environment that gets us to stop and to listen and to pay attention. So anytime I had those experiences, I paid attention and I think so many of those experiences connected to abandoning, to abandoned children, connected to being generous and sharing with those who don't have as much connected to using the skills that I have. So everything lined up when I, when I started the foundation and I would say that it is my, one of my spiritual dreams that I've manifested on the physical plane. So how do you use spirituality in your daily life to help other people? Well, for one thing, part of our program, so we don't just put orphan youth through school, they also have a mentor and they write a monthly journal and in the journal there are questions that starts to help them look at their inner landscape and start to ask some deeper questions about their existence about their spiritual trajectory in life and not seeing themselves as victims um, we also do a summer camp and we have various workshops there where Spirituality is woven in during workshops where we work with them looking at their life, rewriting their life story from the point of view of a soul who has come into this earth 
We are not inferior or superior. We are all welcome guests of this planet. And they just chose an incarnation that is a little more challenging. They have a, a bigger curriculum. And sometimes we don't know why the soul takes on such a tremendous curriculum. Uh, to be abandoned at birth or to suffer tremendous uh, abuse, abandonment, poverty, to learning disabilities and to still have to learn the lesson of love, of forgiveness and of building yourself as a strong person on all levels, physical, mental, emotional and spiritual. So I think they have a great opportunity when they work with us to learn about their, their soul, their calling in life, uh, of rewriting their life story, which I think it's, it's what all those who have a spiritual awareness should do, to, to really write it from the point of view of the soul's incarnation and what we came here to manifest on a, on a tangible level that uh, leads us back home more healed and hopefully in the process we've up uplifted our fellow human beings. You mentioned that in your book <clears throat> you were having a conversation about dreams with Carmen. Yes, yes. Right? What about that conversation and, and did well, you... Well, I devoted a whole chapter to it. I love dreams. I feel that they are such a rich source that inform our life. I, I never go to bed without a notebook and a pen by my bed. And I've, it's almost like an exercise. I'm an athlete of the dreams. I not only remember most of my dream and jot them down, but I use something called dream um, incubation, which is you ask, you set an intention or you ask a question to be revealed to you some clarity or the answer in the dream state because there are so many important questions that inform our lives that we cannot get in a rational way with the awake mind that we that we use on a daily basis. So we go into that sacred space to harvest answers. And to me, really, Freud said it's the royal path to our subconscious, and it is. Things that we really have a hard time healing sometimes in our everyday lives can be healed in dreams. So. I look at dreams as a way to get sometimes answers to the questions. Sometimes I receive healing. You can have a deeply, a deep experience and go through a lot of negative stuff and wake up and journal and really process a lot. You don't have to have that drama with your husband or, you know, in your day to day life. I also look for to dreams as messages. Sometimes we get messages of connections that we didn't think of making, an inspiration for a new project or a dream. Or sometimes even, believe it or not, uh, about two weeks ago when the, you know, I felt the stock market was going up and up and up and up and up. And I, I pay attention to the stock market too. I have some stocks I follow. And it woke me up and said, Stefania, you should set it so that they automatically sell when it gets to a certain point. And sure enough, two days later, it's just we went through the big dip. Uh, so we get messages too. Um, and sometimes too from our ancestors who visit us and they help us or they have a message for us. One of my most beautiful dreams was my deceased grandmother showed up in a dream a few years ago. And during that time, I was just feeling, I couldn't feel love inside. I, I was saying, God, I know I'm loved. I'm just not feeling it anymore. And my grandmother showed up in my dreams and we were dancing. And the way she looked at me, I was just sobbing. She reminded me how deeply loved and lovable I am. And I, I felt she was, truly God sent and I woke up feeling in my bones that I am loved and I am lovable. So yeah, sometimes our ancestors show up and they give, bring us these incredible messages. I loved, Stefania, the term you use, uh, I am an athlete of the dreams. Mm. Um, what would you suggest our audience, our millions of viewers that we have, how would you suggest them to become, I don't know if athlete, 
but maybe you know to to become close to an athlete with the dreams. Yeah, our dreams can be our allies. So I can start with just a few suggestions. First of all, to realize that absolutely every single person dreams, supposedly seven to ten dreams a night. So we all have them. Some of us haven't been in the habit of remembering or writing them down, but it's very possible. So for those who think they can't remember their dream, set an intention to remember your dream. Keep your paper and pen next to the bed. And if you wake up, don't start talking to your spouse or check your phone. Just sit quietly and think about the world you've just come out from. If you can't remember anything, I suggest they think about the 10 most important people in their lives because often the dreams that we dream are often about the same 10 or more people that are the most important in our life. Lastly, drink water before you go to bed. I find that when I go through periods when I can't remember my dreams very well, if I drink water, I wake up to go to the bathroom and I almost always interrupted a dream. So then um, what I suggest is that you always write a sentence or a few words on the paper that remind you of your dream. You don't have to write the entire dream right when you wake up or, right, or when you go to go to the bathroom. Just write a short sentence, a few words that will stimulate your memory in the morning. And then you journal the dream. And I like to always write my dreams in present tense as if they are already happening, like I'm running through the streets. Uh, somebody in a red car is chasing me. So it's always in present tense and I give the dream a title and then a subtitle. And sometimes those alone can be such unbelievable messages or ahas of, of uh, patterns or things that are happening in our lives. So dreams are an incredible resource for us to get messages, to get answers, and to receive divine messages. Um, absolutely. You mentioned before that you are helping, you know, uh, kids in um, Romania, so they yes. can access college. Yes. If I understood it well. And they are all orphaned. They don't have parents. Exactly. Um, I was um, I was wondering because when you I was picturing that so vivid image of yes. you going into an orphanage and those yeah. kids calling you mom. Yeah. Right. Um, it, have you, have you thought of maybe helping also those you know, younger kids before they get well, that age? Yeah, I started out. So the first two years we worked with those kids and we hired additional caregivers to hold and cuddle babies and we built playgrounds. But then with time, that was about 15 years ago when I first started, with time there were more funds from the European Union and more help. And we noticed that a lot of the big orphanages have started to dissolve. The kids were moved into foster care or into uh, home type settings, like small homes with maybe eight kids, two caretakers. So every time, every year when I would go back, I would ask the caretakers and I would talk to government officials, trying to find out what are the biggest needs. And they always came back to the same thing, saying it's those who are 18 years of age and who are graduating high school, they are pushed into the streets, they don't have a profession, they don't have life skills, they are expected to become self-empowered, productive adults who are contributing to society, but they are so weak and it's too soon to ask these things of them. And I remembered, because I was a young immigrant around the same age when I came to America, I remember how hard but how much those years define you, 18 to about 25, because it's when you get a college degree, but it's really when you mature as a human being. And so I thought, this is what I think our specific focus is gonna be, because so many people are working with the younger kids. I love young kids, because they are magic, and especially before they get to like second grade, you know, one through seven, I adore them. But I feel that in the end, this is what was meant to be for our efforts. It was the, the last chance for the kids who grew up in those terrible circumstances to get a college education, to get a mentor. Our mentors are doctors, 
our, our NASA scientists. I, I've been able to, to entice some of the top Romanian Americans here in the diaspora and in Romania to be their mentor. And so the kids receive a lot of emotional, financial, and I think spiritual help too, so that they can go into the world with a strong backbone at the age of 25. Wow. Yeah. With all this, all your wisdom and all your inspiration, do you also help people in the U.S.? Yes, I do. I, I belong to a foundation that actually inspired me to start mine here in Los Angeles for impoverished kids. We actually, there's 200 women, we raise a million dollars each year and award it to a child-related um, charity. But I'm also very involved in the arts and the arts that have a, uh, an effect in, the, in our social lives. Um, and I'm, I'm involved in, in contributing to various social causes. So I'm on the board of uh, museums, Graduate School of Education, the Tisch School of the Arts in New York for the film and television. At Columbia, I'm on the board of, um, they have a Roma, which is the politically correct term for gypsies. They have a platform and, you know, there's a lot we need to learn about Roma and uh, they've always been on the fringes of society and we just want to learn and they created a community online. Um, in fact, I learned that about 10% of our students are Roma and they are brilliant and they are capable. That's my message to the world that uh, a lot can be done. So I'm active. Oh, and I'm the chair of the Romanian committee within the Southeast European Film Festival here in Los Angeles. So my passions are spirituality, the arts and philanthropy. And where these axes meet, there's where Stefania shows up. <laughs> yeah. How, how do you how do you reach all those organizations? How do you how are you able to be involved in so many uh, organizations yeah. and have you know the impact and the inspiration in so many places yeah. well first I only say yes to the ones that I feel I have a calling and I'm aligned with so I'm asked by many but I'm only involved in about seven so it has been the ones that our kids have been affiliated with for example our son studies at the Tisch School of the Arts in New York he studies film and television so we are participating there. I'm still part of the Romanian community, so the film festivals that they hold in New York and here are important to me to support Ameri uh, Romanian filmmakers. And uh, yeah, for the museum, it's the Vende Museum, which is art of the countries that were be behind the Iron Curtain. And Romania obviously was one of them, so I, uh, I go with where my heart is and I would say that because um, I'm in a lucky position of having a social and financial platform from which I can give, I have that luxury to choose really what resonates with my heart and spirit. Excellent. Yeah. Well, it has been a big, big, massive pleasure for, for us oh. and for our audience to have you here today. So uh, thank you, thank you very My much. My pleasure, it has been an honor and I hope that uh, your audience has resonated with some of the messages and that at least some of you will start paying attention to your dream, dreams and journaling them. I think you're gonna find a rich source of, of answers and inspirations in your life. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Angel. <laughs> Again, I am Angel Rebo with Mindalia TV and thank you for being with us today.